I mean, we are talking about people who are dying and don't, don't need to be dying. It is truly alarming. It's, it was so stunning and so horrifying, and it's really hard to believe that it's something that people just don't know. It all started back in January 2000 with the award-winning Canadian documentary Silent Alarms. Silent Alarms exposed a well-kept secret that the type of smoke alarms most of us rely on are nowhere near as safe or as reliable as we've been led to believe. However, Silent Alarms named names and was silenced due to litigation. But this story has to be told, so we decided to make our own documentary one that couldn't be silenced. The majority of smoke detectors sold today do not detect the type of fire that is most likely to kill you. Tom Clark, investigative journalist from the film Silent Alarms. What you are about to see could save your life. You will learn that the type of smoke detectors you use could make the difference between life or death. After our aquarium test aired on TV, the Indiana State Fire Marshal said, We have 5 million smoke detectors in this state that are ionisation detectors that may fail in the time of need, and this is the most important life safety issue the fire service will face in our lifetime. Boston Fire Department's Chief Fleming said, I think it is responsible for as many as 10,000 deaths since 1990. When we first appeared on national TV, we claimed that the ionisation type of smoke alarm, supposedly protecting hundreds of millions of families around the world, are dangerous. David Isaac from the Fire Protection Association of Australia appeared on the programme. David. I understand you've done extensive research regarding this issue. Why is it that ionisation smoke alarms pass global fire safety standards? Adrian, I think it would help if I could explain how we measure the performance of smoke detectors and smoke alarms in Australia in order to pass the tests for approval. We use a measure called percent light obscuration per metre. At 10% obscuration per metre, the average person would be running for the door. You wouldn't be very comfortable in a room at 10% obscuration smoke. 20% obscuration is the maximum allowed to pass a test for approval in Australia. Now what we discovered is the Australian Standards Committee doing some inquiries into test data to our horror was that ionisation smoke alarms are allowed to go to 50 to 60% obscuration per metre. I'll say that again, 50 to 60% obscuration per metre. Dangerously high, totally unacceptable. You can imagine, if you run for the door at 10%, you probably won't find the door at 50 to 60%. How could this be possible? In 1976, the US government funded testing of smoke alarms in typical residential applications. And in 1976, they discovered that the ionisation smoke alarm had an inability to detect smoke from typical smouldering fires. Fires such as a cigarette dropped on a couch or a mattress or in the smouldering electrical fault that would occur in a home. The type of smouldering fires that occur at night when residents are asleep. The type of fires that statistically initiate the most fatal fires in residential structures. And for 30 years, this information has been kept from the public, largely by authorities who insist that the evidence is inconclusive. They had falsified the test, they had lied about the results, they had cooked the data. Hatton exposed the Dunes tests cover-up and distributed 3,000 smoke detector fraud reports detailing the falsification of ionization alarm performance. And so began Patton's crusade against fire deaths. Dr. Vito Bobroskis is the first person ever to earn a PhD in fire science, a former senior government fire researcher 
and probably one of the few people to read the fine print in this, the government's massive 2004 smoke detector study. Find out more about NIST on the Foundation's website. After the aquarium test, full-scale firefighter testing by the Indiana Fire Department and independent scientific testing by Texas A&M University... Their science isn't any good, frankly. As a scientist, practicing science that doesn't replicate what the world really is in terms of physics uh, is worthless. Bob Siegel, one of America's leading investigative journalists, asked UL... In a situation like that, the smoke alarms should be going off. The fact is, we know if it's a working smoke alarm, when the smoke hits that alarm, it will sound the alarm. What we're doing for you today is a follow-up to the aquarium test we did a few months ago, where we set a smoldering fire into a, in a fish tank, only this time we're going to be doing it in a real house. The room that I'm in right now still has an ionization detector, but hasn't gone off yet. O2 levels 13.9 percent. There it goes. We finally got the ionization smoke detector to go off. We've been here almost uh, over an hour. Uh, you can see this room is not survivable without an air mask. You probably couldn't get your kids out. You make the decision how to best protect your family. Is there any scientific explanation for why in this real-world situation we have smoke detectors that are not going off in a room full of smoke. I really don't know. The Indiana State Fire Marshal declared a state of emergency after conducting tests that displayed the ineffectiveness of ionization smoke alarms. State Representative Mike Turner says his bill would ban the most common type of smoke detector. The cigarette companies use like tobacco to cause cancer. We're in a similar situation here. We've got outdated technology that does not work. Turner believes the manufacturers are more concerned about making money than saving lives. If Turner's bill passes, the millions of dollars they've spent to get new ionization detectors on the market will be lost. In 2005, everything for us changed. Around 6 in the morning is when the call came in. Fire. From a fire standpoint, it really wasn't that big. What complicated it was the amount of people that we had in there. They had um, a street full of people screaming at them that they had kids inside. This right here is a picture of the girls' room. The beds were unoccupied. The children were on the floor. At some point during the event, they had woken up um, and were huddled together on the floor. The apartment had three hardwired ionization smoke detectors. One in the master bedroom, one in the girls' room, and one in the main family room. The, uh, the end story as far as the victims are concerned, Brett's on the left, Kim, obviously the mom in the back. And then from left to right, it's Michaela, Krista, and Tori. Art, the dad in the back, he's the only survivor from the fire. The four kids and the mom all died. Working smoke alarms in an apartment house, full of smoke where the smoke alarms did not sound. The first video that you saw with Bob Siegel talking with a representative from UL where he swore up and down that smoke alarm will sound when the smoke reaches the smoke alarm. Can anybody explain to me where the validity in that statement is? In July 2010, Chief Mark McGinn made a challenge. I'm going on record and calling for the immediate re removal of this fraudulent and dangerous alarm. The fire chiefs need to wake up and take a stand like the International Association of Firefighters did in 2008 by denouncing the ionization alarms. Since July 2010, after several cities brought in mandatory photoelectric legislation, Chief McGinn was recognized with a Californian government resolution.
Whereas, renowned throughout the nation for his advocacy of photoelectric detectors, Chief Mark McGinn worked tirelessly over the course of his career to outlaw the use of ionization smoke detectors, which are flame detectors and not smoke detectors. 